1981, a Jane Doe case takes over the nation. And I had never heard of this story of this woman. Uh, uh, and I, I did not spend, you know, a whole day trying to dig more into this, but all the news stories end in 1981. So what happens to this woman after all of this? I don't know. But okay. 1980 woman, a woman, 81, a woman is found naked and near death in a state park near the beach in Fort Lauderdale. And she spends the next six months in a hospital in a psychiatric reco- uh, facility, recovers her cognitive abilities, but never her memory. She's an amnesiac. She's known as Jane Doe the whole time. And she goes on Good Morning America and asks for help identifying her family. And this causes her real family to find her. That's our daughter. They come and claim her. And apparently they had been estranged for the previous five to seven years. What caused the estrangement? The articles don't really address that. And it's mostly from the mother's point of view. And I don't know anything, but I'm just like reading this and reading between the lines. And like, this doesn't seem okay. Like, we're not sure that's the mom? No, no, no. Just oh. like, you know, like a, the article is written from the point of view of like, there, there's this article, we'll link to it in Washington Post that interviews like lots of parents of of ad- adults in their 20s and 30s who quote, run away, unquote. And it's like these, the, the they stray, these ne'er-do-wells, they go and they try to find themselves because they read some books in college and who knows? And now it's like, well, what, were they gay? Were they trans? Like right. what, what was really happening? We don't know. Um, and I'm not saying that's what was happening here. It's just very weird. You have a, fo- a picture from a newspaper article. Is she on the right or the left? Which one is it? She's the one on the right, the small one. There's a small one? The one who doesn't have curly hair, the younger one. Okay. The small one. Yeah, the, 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 she she reunites with her family. And uh, then there's some follow-up articles like, well, well, for one thing, she said she didn't want to go back to her old name. She just wants to be Jane Doe. <laughs> um, she doesn't, she never, she doesn't, re- at least in the follow-up articles, she still doesn't remember her parents, but she says they're nice people. And, um, and I'm not gay anymore, so it's working out. Yeah. So like this, again, not knowing how this story actually ends, because there's no reporting that I could find after yeah. it. This seems like a very uh, tragic story. Mm-hmm. And I also wish I had more time to learn about amnesia and how it really works. Yeah, that's it's one of those things that I feel like it's just a plot device. I feel like I don't understand it in the wild. But this seems like a thing that Hollywood's like, the Jane Doe on Good Morning America. That'll make a great idea for a movie. Okay. So... Leslie Dixon, the screenwriter, is assigned to it. Earlier in 1987, she wrote a movie called Outrageous Fortune with Bette Midler and Shelley Long that was a big hit. Never heard of it, but uh, she gets commissioned to write the screenplay. She said, she said, quote, I was daunted from the get go by the idea that amnesia was the central plot device. I thought it was hokey, but I was in no position to complain. Somebody was paying me to write a screenplay, Mm. end quote. So she later writes movies like Pay It Forward. Freaky Friday, and she has a credit on the upcoming Inside Out 2. All right. And to direct the movie, they go to Gary Marshall. And he's busy eating a hamburger. What is this fucking picture you're showing me? (laughs) That's him eating a hamburger, presumably at Arnold's. He's the creator of Happy Days. He's a mega TV producer and then started directing in the 80s. Young Don, uh, what what is that? Young Don Juan. No, Young Doctor in Love. Young Doctor in Love. The Flamingo Kid. (laughs) Nothing in common. What the fuck are these movies? I don't know. I don't know either. But then he directs Beaches, Pretty Woman. Pretty Woman is an enormous hit. Frankie and Johnny exited. And dear God, The Other Sister. I looked up the premise of The Other Sister. I know what it is. I've seen it. It is an autism movie. I I think the, they don't describe it as autism. They literally just say the R word in the premise of the movie. Okay. And it's like, she wants to be in love. And people are like, I don't know about that. I bet it's a great movie to watch now. Yeah, fuck. Uh, Runaway Bl- Bride. And then, you know, he directed like The Princess Diaries. Oh, wow. Uh, and then ended his career making a series of holiday movies about <laughs> a lot of different people. Valentine's <laughs> Day, New Year's Eve, Mother's Day. Very important figure in filmmaking and TV and comedy. Uh, brother of Penny Marshall. We've never yeah. done a Gary Marshall movie before. I thought we had, but I was thinking. I mean, we're, we're chipping away at the edges of stuff that I like. But yeah, mm-hmm. none of these are... Load bearing beams. I was thinking Penny Marshall, who did a League of Their Own, which oh, okay. previous episode of League of Their Own. I mean, Pretty Woman is so many people's load bearing beam. I don't know why it's not for me. Mm-hmm. Don't know why. Runaway don't know why bride. these things just attach. Um, no, but but uh, my best friend's wedding. It's not, it. it's not a Julia Roberts aversion. It's just beaches could never be a load bearing beam for me. It's too devastating. Frankie and Johnny, I liked, but I remember being kind of serious. Exit to Eden. Oh, I mean, that one's just crazy. 
Yeah. Who's that in Dear God? Is that Greg Kinnear? Yeah. Okay. He's good in it. I remember liking that movie. I just probably rented it once, though. Look at how young Goldie Hawn is here. Okay, Goldie and Hawn, and Goldie and <laughs> Goldie and Hawn, Kurt yeah. and Russell. How do these people meet? Well, for, you know, right now they've been together for more than forty years, but they've never been married. Right now, today, on today's date, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Goldie Hawn told Chris Wallace last year, "Quote: Why should we get married? Yeah, it's work. Isn't that a better question? I like the idea that I can wake up in the morning and make decisions every day if I want to be here." End quote. Yeah, that's true. Now, you can do that if you're married, too. Get married. That's what God wants. That's what I say. Um, Shut up, Matt. <laughs> okay. Goldie Hawn made her film debut in, in this movie in 1966, the one and only genuine original family band, a Disney movie starring the Disney child star, Kurt Russell. Oh, and this is how they Jesus. Meet. Kurt Russell was a Disney mo- like live action Disney movie star in the 60s and 70s. The computer wore tennis shoes. Uh, you let the, that's him on the right. Uh, so allegedly Walt Disney's final words were Kurt Russell before he died. (laughs) I don't remember the actual story and it might've been, he wrote it down and people like, what did that, what is this? What about Kurt Russell? It was a money. It was like a citizen Kane thing. Right. Kurt Russell. So, um, yeah, they, they met on the set of this movie. Uh, Goldie was five years older than Kurt and then did, they didn't meet again until, uh, until the eighties and Goldie Hawn said in 2012, about when she met Kurt Russell in 1966, quote, I was 21 and he was 16 and I thought he was adorable, but he was much too young. And then years later, we met up again and I liked him and I remembered that I liked him very much when I first met him. But we both said we would never go out with another actor. So it just shows mm. you never can tell. How much older than you am I, Matt? Four years. Just say five for the purposes oh, of this. Topic. <laughs> sorry, I didn't. Re- okay. <laughs> no, yeah, you're okay. five years. Hey. And we met on the set of Law Firm, the uh, movie. Okay. Goldie Hawn. Here was her deal. She broke out in. TV on the sketch comedy show Laugh In mm-hmm. and kind of mi- had her niche playing dumb blondes, but she became an I- fashion icon, TV icon, movie icon, a giant star in the 70s. She won an Oscar Best Supporting Actress for Cactus Flower hmm. in 1969. She's the star of Steven Spielberg's first feature film or theatrical feature film, The Sugarland Express, a very good movie, uh, Shampoo. And then she's like the producer and star of Private Benjamin in 1980, which was both an enormous hit <laughs> and she was nominated for Best Actress. For that movie, for like a silly comedy. That's like how important it was. So when I watched this movie, I was like, I am prepared to be blown away. And let me tell you, that movie fucking sucks. What sucks about it? Everything. Okay. Yeah, so the premise is she's like a rich princess. (sighs) I mean, she's like a spoiled rich girl who's, but she's in her, uh, you know, 30s, who gets married to a nice man who then, who then dies on her wedding night uh, as they make love. And now she has nowhere to go in life. So she decides to enlist in the army. What? And then there's like 20 minutes of her, like her drill sergeants being mean to her. And she's like, I want to talk to the manager of the army. Okay. Uh, But then don't, wouldn't you know it? She starts to get the hang of it and starts to thrive. Now I assume that's what the whole movie is going to be, right? No. By minute 55, she's mastered it. She's, you know, a commissioned officer or whatever. (laughs) It's like, okay, well, there's still an hour left to go. And it's like, she gets deployed to a, to Brussels and meets a man and has like a weird domestic drama with him. What? This movie why I mean, the the quote good the quote unquote good parts of the movie are like you have seen it all it's so predictable i guess it's a little charming but then the movie just keeps going and going wow. and going oh thank you don't see private benjamin keep it private kurt russell on the other hand was in those disney movies like the aforementioned computer wore tennis shoes but he wants to transition into being a legit adult actor and uh He's looking around for picture for for projects, and he meets John Carpenter. And they first work together in a TV movie uh, called Elvis, in which he plays Elvis Presley. Supposedly, this is a really good movie. I could see that. I mean, he looks like Elvis. I've never seen this this movie, uh, mm. but apparently, it's really good. But then they work together a bunch more, including Escape from New York, which is his sort of big, you know, adult breakthrough playing Snake Plissken, <laughs> iconic action hero, and then The Thing and Big Trouble in Little China and. Uh, what else did I escape from LA? Whatever. You know, he's also in Silkwood and used cars and he sort of breaks through, but he's always like, at least during their, their both of their heydays, she was a much bigger star than mm-hmm. he was. I think Kurt Russell was always a, why isn't he a bigger star than he is? It feels okay. like, it feels like he's always on the precipice and it never really happens. I mean, there's tombstone. There's like, I don't know. It, you think it's because the Goldie Hawn connection? Like, there's just like a pushback. Like, you know, you can't have it all. No, it just doesn't happen for people. But I, I think I think he's also like 
was going to say Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie got together after they were both megastars. Maybe if you come up together, you, only mm. one of you gets to be it. Just there's, there. I don't know, there's maybe it's he, he, just not picking the right movies at the right yeah. moments. I don't know, but he's had, he's a legend. He's had a long career. He's he's amazing. He's a, he's a person I like more and more the older I get. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like so many... Um, like the reason he played Star Lord's father in Guardians of the Galaxy Two is because it's like Chris Pratt's uh, Chris Pratt's sort of ideal uh-huh. movie persona is sort of Kurt Russell, but he hasn't really followed that path. Uh, Got it. Anyway, I forgot. I forgot about him in that role. He's very good in that. Yeah, and he had like his Quentin Tarantino movies, and he's in the Fast and Furious movies. Oh, he's 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 doing good. Look at him with um, his long hair in his library. All right, glasses. now 1984. They both are auditioning for a movie called Swing Shift, or he's auditioning. I think I think Goldie Hawn is a producer. Doesn't have to audition. But this is Jonathan Demme's movie, his big follow-up to his movie Melvin and Howard. And she had, they, they reconnect during the audition process. And she had kids from previous marriage, including Kate Hudson. And she said, no. seeing how Kurt Russell interacted with them, like won him over to her. Mm. Uh, but yeah, the, so the movie gets a lot of attention. Like, look, these two beautiful stars are falling in love while they make this movie. But this movie, Swing Shift, have you seen it? No. It's um, it's not a very good movie, but it is like a very famous story of a the star producer Goldie Hawn like feuding with the director and basically seizing control of the movie to retool it uh, around her. And to to like sort of boost the love story between the two of them, there is this. I'll, I'll put a link to this this uh, uh, sight and sound story about about the story of this movie because there's a a very famous director's cut that apparently is great that is very similar and yet totally different from the the final cut. Um, okay, but what are you saying? Are you saying she's a nightmare? Or not that she's saying a ni- not, she was blinded by love. That she she had uh, I think maybe wanted this to be more like a Private Benjamin style comedy silly comedy and the director wasn't necessarily on board with that okay and um but that's the movie where they where they they fall in love and their relationship takes off and um yeah and then overboard and then overboard okay uh not 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 a giant hit i was surprised by that uh, it makes twenty six million dollars at the box office on a twenty two million dollar budget. The reviews were mixed. Roger Ebert has this review where he grudgingly gives it three stars, but he has this quote: Who "Fucking ask him." There is hardly a major development in this story that we can't predict thirty minutes in advance. But what does it matter when the performances are so much fun, and there are so many comic delights along the way? This is the kind of movie that not only could have been directed by Frank Capra or Preston Sturgis, but may have been. End quote. I was thinking of Frank Capra's um, It Happened One Night, which I actually just watched. And it has kind of a, it's Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert, and she's like a rich heiress, mm-hmm. and she gets stuck with Clark Gable, who's more salt of the earth, and he teaches her how to be like regular folk. And then. Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. In 2017, Goldie Hawn went on the James Corden show, and she said she and Kurt Russell got into bed one night together to, to make love. Stop saying it That's like that. That's what she Just says. Just say fuck. Okay. She said make love. It doesn't mean you have to say it. And she said they caught this on TV and instead they settled in and watched the whole thing. It reminded caught them. what on TV? Overboard. Oh. And it reminded them while they fell in love. Mm. Okay. Yay. That's the history of. So to get them going for sex. No, it just prevented. It cock blocked them. They didn't make love because. Okay. Instead, they're old. They they're cock blocking my joke, man. Oh, sorry. That's fine. I just like that this is their Viagra, both of them. Let's watch Overboard. Yeah. It doesn't matter, Matt. 